Good evening. <clears throat> uh, what I want to talk with you tonight about is how the flat earth is changing, where innovation is actually happening, how people are working, and how people are learning. Uh, now, first, I, I want to make sure everyone's real clear. When I talk about the flat earth, I'm not going to convince you that the earth is flat. I know it's roundish. And I do have a separate talk on, on why the earth really is flat, and I can give that at the end of this talk. The reason I use flat earth is I'm trying to get a picture in everyone's head. And so I wanted to visualize a world that, from a capability and capacity for innovation standpoint, the world really is a plane. And you've got people all over the world, so they're all over this plane, right? <clears throat> and traditionally, where does technology come from? It comes from these uh, so-called technology hubs. That's going to be things like Los Angeles and San Diego, Baltimore, Boston, Tokyo, London, and others. But it's very interesting, though, because what's happening is as we get more connected, right, and I think everybody's probably got a cell phone in this room, hopefully not a flip phone, I mean an actual cell phone, a, you know, a smartphone or something like, do you have a, do you have a flip phone? Okay. <laughs> but as we start looking at, all right, some of the enabling technologies that are out there, the tools and the interconnectedness, the, the, there's a real fallacy that's starting to come out, which is that the technology hubs are the only place where you can get real and significant innovation. And that's not necessarily true. And in fact, we're seeing data that says otherwise. We're seeing an ebb of the population flow into these big, large, you know, just gigantic cities. And more people, and, and, and it's small, and it's a slow change, but they are starting to change. They are starting to stay in some of those uh, flyover state areas about the geography of the whole thing. So we talked a little bit about the connectedness, right, and the tools and all the, all, all the, all the um, everybody's always on all the time. And we say that, but let, let's just vet that a little bit. Let's validate that. So I've got two examples. The first is a, person exam, a personal example. So last fall I was in Japan for, uh, for business travel, and uh, I'm on a bullet train from Tokyo to Osaka. It's about 11.30 at night, and you're doing 188 miles an hour, and it's super smooth. And I'm a happy man. i got two things. i got sushi. And I got Wi-Fi, so I'm I'm, I'm real I'm tickled pink right now. So I'm catching up on email, eating my sushi, maybe an adult beverage on the side, and all of a sudden my boss calls on a video call, and okay, so we start talking, you know, and about the week, and then uh, one of her peers comes into her office because it's morning here in Cedar Rapids, you know, it's almost middle of the night over there, and so we're working through some things, getting ready for another negotiation coming up, <clears throat> and. All of a sudden, uh, an IM pops up from my wife. She says, hey, the printer at home's broken. And I go, okay. So I take the window that's my boss, and I move her over to the left, and I open up another window and bring up Amazon and start looking for a new laser printer. Still engaged in this conversation. We're working through some slides. And by the way, I'm editing her slides on her desktop and all that good stuff. And I'm ordering a printer. Order the printer. Tell my wife the printer's order. We get the negotiation tactic squared away, say goodbye to my boss. And, and I'm just sitting there going, that really was very incredible. And all the while, I've got my phone that's telling me I'm doing you know, 188 to 190 miles an hour, and I still have sushi left over. So this is, a really, this is an awesome, awesome night, right? So that, that's kind of a you know, gee whiz kind of example. We all have a story like that. But, but let me get maybe a little more local. It's a processing computer that drives the display system. And uh, that box, that, that the design of that took hundreds of engineers in Iowa and Wisconsin and Minnesota and India. A lot of money and a lot of time, and it's going to be built here in Bellevue. Now, to give you some significant, okay, big hairy deal, right? The 737 is the highest volume production airplane in the world. Airbus contends the A320 is, it's debatable, we let them duke it out. But for the most part, Boeing says, yeah, we are the biggest and they are. You know how many are airborne right now? 1,700. Typical loading of those airplanes, passenger-wise, means there's at least 300,000 people doing 400 miles an hour in an aluminum can. That's 35 some odd thousand feet, right? So in a couple of years after we've built a lot of these boxes, what's coming out of Bellevue here, local, and what was designed for the most part right here in the state of Iowa with some guys in India, some guys in Wisconsin and Minnesota, Minnesota it's, it, it's going to be that box. So the point of those two examples, though, is I think we've validated, yep, there's a connectivity, 
there's the tools we can make this happen, whether it's you know within a city, within a state, across the country, around the world, right? So as people started recognizing, golly, I, I, I know I can work a little bit different because I can work from home. Well, if I can work from home, why, why, why the heck am I working in the same city as here because I can just do everything remote? Why don't I move out to Boulder or something like that, right? And so what we saw was this, it was, it was slow, but it was important. What we saw was people going, you know what? I'm going to carry two business cards. And the first business card is the business card for the company they work for, the traditional career, right? And the second business card is for the side business that I got. Okay? And if you think there's just a few of these people, from what we can tell, there's, well, not from what we can tell, we know that at least 30% of the U.S. Work, workforce carries two business cards. Okay? Now, the side business, what we're talking about there is these people are literally hiring themselves out after their day job. They're hiring themselves out to go do software development, documentation, verification, system design, build some hardware, whatever it is. And what's great is they're choosing how little they work, how much they work, for whom and where, right? So you're seeing a, a shift away from that traditional model to something that's a little different. Interviews. Trends say that that number is going to go from 30% to about half within the next five years. And in 10 years from now, about mid-2020s, it's going to go to about two-thirds of the workforce. So two-thirds of the workforce is going to carry not just two, by the way, but three business cards. And that's, that's really interesting because what it does is that is the rise of the freelance technologist. And in fact, there's a whole kind of this uh, cottage industry growing up around it. There are marketplaces for these, uh, for these uh, freelance technologists and these businesses to be able to find each other, kind of feel each other out a little bit, make sure that the skills they have and the business they need to go or the problem they need to go solve matches before they extend a contract, right? And it, it's interesting. It's like the Yelp of freelance technologists. I, I, it, before I came here this afternoon, I went there and I looked for somebody. Okay, I need somebody that can code this in C Sharp, six months job or three months job or whatever it is. And I'm not kidding. First is I, the first person I found, four and a half out of five stars, 100 plus reviews. A little more expensive than I was thinking I'd spend, but that's very interesting. Next person, one star out of five star. First review in capital letters, do not hire this person. I went, okay, great. What's interesting, though, is you look at the companies and you, you find the same reviews, right? So it's kind of self-policing, right? Self, self-regulating. But it was interesting. So, so, so you go, okay, so this is interesting because you've got... Not only have we solved the geographical problem, all right, it doesn't matter now because you can be anywhere and, and get to have all the information that you need. And we've now also solved these. Some people want to work a little bit different. And we've got businesses going, you know what, I'll, 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 I'll work with that too. So now you have a captive, captive workforce and you've got a captive business, right? So then we started looking at, okay, so that's interesting, but what about mastery? Because if you've got these freelance technologists, right, kind of, it's micro work, man. These guys, they, 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 get, they get in there for a week or a month, maybe six months, very rarely anything up to a year. They bang out a project, and by the way, quality stuff. And they deliver it, company's happy, the team's happy, right? The freelancer gets paid, boom, next gig. Or go, ship, go, go, uh, go fishing for a week, right? Then get on upwork.com, literally, go find another gig. Okay, but there's a little problem with that. It's called mastery. And so one of the things that we're trying to solve or work through is you've got all these individuals, these micro work, right? These guys that work for a week or a month or six months. But what about the problems that really are brand new innovation technology? Brand, I mean, you're, you're actually creating new math or new science or new engineering or new materials or all that. That's where you need mastery. The folks that have been working on the same domain for the last 30 years, right? Great example of that is there's a new processor that just came out that we're looking to use. It was seven years in the making. The core team was 12 engineers, 320 collective years of experience across, uh, among them. I don't think that the guys that built Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, smart guys, by the way, I don't think they could have done that right out of college. So we've got to figure out what that balance is, right? All right, so we've solved the geography. We've solved the, uh, the, 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 the workforce match to the business. Now we got this problem though, because I just talked about how there's all these new technologies and this new engineering. That, that means really we got people that need to start learning and they need to start learning differently. So 
Great news, these guys go solve their own problems, right? Massive online, massive open online courses, MOOCs, not a great name, but it, it, gets, the, it gets the point across. More people getting higher degrees later in life, more people getting certifications, continuated education, on-demand training, and then more collaboration within a domain, but in unlike industry. So for example, we work a lot with uh, Rockwell Collins, we work with John Deere, right, non-competitive, but we've got common problems, okay? So <clears throat> there's clearly an infrastructure already out there, though, that's supporting these folks, these freelance technologists and the businesses and getting them to, trained up to that new educate, you know, the, 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 the new skill sets, the new technologies and all that good stuff. So this is where, though, you look at, okay, for the folks that are gonna be entering the workforce in the next 10 or 15 years, that's the students here in the middle school and, and, and you know, my little four-year-old and seven-year-old, and this is where I start to get a little anxious because there's, there's some really smart educators up here and in the audience. But so what do we need to do with them to make, within the schools and the students, to set them up for success? And the good news is there's a great emphasis, and you heard about it earlier, on the four engines of the innovation growth, and that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And that's all great about the what. And we need that, we've gotta have that. We are short staff, by the way. I, I, I bang my head against my door every day trying to find engineers to fill the open jobs. But there's also a how. Because what you have now is you, you're gonna have this, you, you, you gotta have, in the workforce, in the, in the, in the big world, you're gonna have what? You're gonna have this kind of homogenous commodity kind of workforce, right? With nothing more than a Yelp rating. But if I could find somebody that's really darn smart and boy, they got energy and they're self, they're self-motivated, and they collaborate, and they communicate. I want, I want that person. I want that guy or gal on the team. And so make sure that we're also teaching the how. I know we talked about it earlier, but make sure we're also teaching the how. And that's a call to the teachers and the principals and the parents and, and you know, look at the mirror myself, right? Let me go back. Remember, I opened up with the flat earth, right? So... We talked a little bit about how it doesn't really matter where you're at. You got access, you got connectivity, which means you got the opportunity. And, and, and one thing I just want to leave, the one thing I want to leave you with is that I don't, based on all that, if you really believe in all the connectivity, if you really believe in all those opportunities, and, and I need you to believe in them because they're real, there is nothing that any student or any engineer or any technologist in San Francisco, they do not have a leg up on in, in any way, shape, or form over anybody in Bellevue, Iowa, or Cedar Rapids, or Linton, North Dakota, in terms of their ability to, and to quote Steve Jobs, to make a dent in the universe. So that's all I got. Thank you so much.